Welcome, Susie. Lovely to see you here today. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Um, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today, having met you last year. And the things you're doing is very exciting. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, Susie, uh, your uh, co-founder and CEO of Ditto. Um, and for those who haven't heard Ditto, it's the UK's first secondment marketplace and I'm sure that would be quite intriguing. So I'd love to ask you a bit more than that. But I think what, what struck me about um, when I, I think I saw you on LinkedIn, first of all, when I saw the posts about Ditto, I thought, my God, this, this is so needed, so desired. You know, having done this in my corporate career where we were moving people around and, you know, writing all the complex contracts and getting agreements done. But th- this is the place where it should be for everyone, right? Exactly that. Exactly that. Couldn't emphasize more. (laughs) (laughs) So look, uh, thank you so much. Uh, So tell us a little bit more about Ditto and why you founded the business. Yeah, of course. So um, probably worth starting with a tiny bit of my background so that it all makes sense. So um, Mm. way back when I started as a graduate in a consultancy and um, did one of those bog standard graduate management consulting schemes, which was brilliant. I loved it because I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. Came out of university with a politics degree and I just thought I wanted to do something that somewhat matters and wasn't really sure where that fit. So um, yeah, I started my graduate scheme and that led a career in management consulting. And during that time, I was in the public sector for that whole time. So I went from project to project throughout government departments. It was brilliant experience, but um, I suppose the bit <clears throat> that kind of completely changed the trajectory of my career um, was when I was effectively seconded, but not quite that literally, to a government department. And I was a deputy director of a portfolio, age 25, huge honor, um, and was a huge learning and development curve for me, um, where I think the amount I learned in the next year it was quite bonkers in comparison to what I'd learned beforehand. So I definitely felt it was a real change in what I wanted to do with my career. And I definitely got the bug for kind of product innovation and development. Um, So anyway, why that matters is because I did that experience, I kind of started to realize two things. One, that being able to move to another organization temporarily was a huge honor, but also hugely important for my learning and development and my upskilling. But also secondly, um, I kind of saw that there was this large issue in public sector, which was there is a big skills gap across industries, absolutely, but public sector feel it more um, sorely, I guess, purely because they have very few options of getting skills in when they don't have them. So training and upskilling those skills internally are quite is quite difficult. And then bringing those skills in temporarily is extremely expensive. So Um, I quit. I left my job, joined an incubator called Antler, and I met my two co-founders, Dave and Hector. Um, And we kind of all really bonded over this space, which was the skills gap. And we thought there's got to be better ways of managing the skills and almost managing workforce talent um, more effectively. Um, In the same breath of wanting that having this skills gap, a lot of organizations were also making a lot of skills redundant and making those roles redundant. And we just thought something's not marrying up here. Um, I was a little bit obsessed with the shared economy. So I definitely brought that angle to it and just thought, you know, with every other asset that you own, um, you kind of have that third way. You can either buy and keep that asset, you can sell it, or you can rent it out, whether it's your house, your car, um, your wardrobe even now. Um, And I thought, why is there not that third way for the workforce? Um, And I think Dave, my co-founder, felt this even more so. Um, He was the ex-talent acquisition director of Dyson. And he, at one point in his career, had to make two thirds of his team redundant to only have to double that same team 12 months later, which I'm sure you're nodding. I'm sure you understand that pain. And I think we just thought there's a problem here, a real problem where workforces cannot affordably, temporarily increase or reduce their workforce. There's no way of being able to do that in a way that's affordable, temporary, and effective, basically. And we thought, surely there's got to be something that we can do here. And that's why Ditto was born. So the secondments marketplace. And in short, what we do is we connect organizations together on our marketplace to either borrow or loan their permanent workforce. So in many ways, bringing the shared economy to the permanent workforce. Um, 
and I, I suppose the easiest metaphor, if you haven't heard of succumbents, um, to relate it to is a bit like football clubs loaning out their players. Um, it's a really good way of upskilling your people, but at the same time, it means that they get game time when things are quiet at home and you get reimbursed for the time that they're away, their gross salary. So um, we see this as a more effective way of managing your workforce and hopefully countering some of those regrettable redundancies that we see quite often um, where you could loan out your workforce instead. Hopefully that was a very long-winded way of explaining where Ditto came from, but it, it gives the context, hopefully. No, it absolutely does. And I think a, a lot of organisations will second people internally. So um, some people do it more formally. So you have an agreement that's six months and then they come yeah. back or they go off on project. And if you work in the tech field, you know, they go off on project all the time and then come back in. So, but this is very much external um, and internal, you know, it moves people around. Yeah. So how, um, I guess, are there are there industries where they where this would work much easier because I'm thinking about some of the companies will go mm, I'm not going to do that sounds really mm -hmm. bureaucratic we yeah. don't even move people around internally so it, it, is there an easier industry for people to start this first yeah it's really interesting so so comments are really common in civil service in construction and architecture um, and also in some finance and also law so law is really common so comments are often used as a tool to kind mm. of BD so business development. Um, but where we found it quite interesting is some of these larger conglomerates. So the likes of Unilever, for example, do this really well. They have a fantastic internal mobility program, but it's a luxury afforded to those large organizations. Um, internal mobility is easier when you have cost centers, cost centers that can kind of cover those costs internally. Um, Whereas a lot of organisations, especially small to medium, just don't have that luxury. Um, and I think that's really where our target is. So organisations that definitely go through quieter times and definitely need cost reducing exercises, but they don't want to lose their talent. Um, we find that that's a real pain for them where they might want to loan out on our platform. But then there's also organisations like public sector um, who are at desperate need for skill sets that are at a more affordable price. So I suppose there's where it's done right now and where it's potentially best for, um, and that hopefully covers both. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting with the public sector, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it, would, it feels like there would be much more bureaucracy wrapped around it, but you're saying not? So they're familiar with succumbents. There's definitely a mm. bureaucracy element, which is obviously as a whole, it will take a long time for the public sector to accept something like this. But given that they do succumbents already, um, this would just be almost another interface for doing them. So if they wanted to loan their people out, rather than them trying to find places for these secondees to go, we're trying to think of a better name than secondees, um, mm. they could just use our platform, for example, and see the opportunities that we have with our private sector members that we have on board. So yes, potentially difficult, but probably the most sorely needed um, spot for succumbents both out and in. Um, so yeah. Mm. So how does this, um, given the example you've just mm. mentioned, so I would say, you know, talk about, you know, you've got talent on a bench, so they come yeah. on a bench and, the, you know, mm. like the player thing. Mm. Um, how how does this stack up then in cost wise? Because that's what you're talking about, right? You know, in, yeah. encouraging people to save money and save their people essentially. So how does yeah. this stack up cost wise? Yeah, so... One thing that we often compare ourselves to is one, the regrettable redundancy element, which mm. costs about 30K on average for per employee. So the people that you're probably going to make redundant that you really wish you didn't have to. So that's one cost. Then it's rehiring for those people that you'll need to in 12 months time. So that's another average 15K cost. Um, and the way that we basically offer an alternative is you can loan out the skill sets you don't need temporarily have their gross salary reimbursed for the time that they're away. So you're not making a loss, you're actually making a gain. Um, mm -hmm. And then when they come back, they're more reskilled and you're obviously avoiding those whole costs throughout that cycle of the redundancy, then the rehire. So we see ourselves as very competitive in that element. And then when it comes to borrowing in talent via secondment, so the other side of the marketplace, as it will, um, often... Based on gross salary reimbursement, it's about two and a half times cheaper than a contractor. So you're getting highly skilled people, highly vouchable people where you can speak to the other side's manager, which is kind of a novel first when you're thinking about hiring. Um, 
and you're bringing in the types of skill sets you need, but something at far more affordable price. Um, so that's how we compete. Mm. And you are talking about highly skilled people moving yeah, around. Exactly that. Yeah. So by highly skilled, we do skill based um, matching. So by highly skilled, yeah. we tend to, and we're finding actually the more and more we go on, given we're a startup, we're finding the types of skill sets with in terms of experience, we're finding it's about three years plus. So people who can hit the ground running in the space that they're going to, um, but are in that space in their career where they're really keen to develop in certain skill sets. So, um, yeah. Mm, I love that. Um, mm. And, but I would like to flip it over then to the skills yeah. piece because, well, we talked mm. about cost, yeah. but actually there is a huge advantage, not only for the employer, but the yeah. individual for retention yes, yeah. mm -hmm. at skill, you know, I talk about skills-based hiring a lot and, you know, acquiring those skills, stacking those skills. That's oh essentially goodness. what this platform will, could do. Bang on. Um, we have yeah. two massive tailwinds um, helping us, mm -hmm. which is one Gen Z are quitting their jobs three times more than millennials for variety and for career development. And this is another way of offering that to them and effectively giving them that retention tool that a lot of organizations don't necessarily have a tool yet to accommodate those types of needs and wants. Um, but also the fact that 94% of today's workforce do not have the skills that they need for 2030, which is only six years away. So we all know, I think, that on-the-job training is probably the most effective and highly effective. Um, but often isn't something that's available to everyone. So I have friends who, for example, are staying in their organization and their role purely for the maternity pay, but they have no way of upskilling because that role doesn't allow them to do so. They would have to quit their job, go somewhere else, and they can't take the pay cut or they can't take the risk. Mm -hmm. This provides another opportunity or another way of providing upskilling to your people and variety to their people that you wouldn't otherwise get. Um, I mean, I've lived and breathed this, as I said, that was kind of the fundamental change in my career because going across the fence, I guess, and going the other side of the fence, I... I got such an amazing immersive experience that I otherwise wouldn't have had. And I think it fundamentally upskilled. That was the reason why I was fundamentally upskilled during that time. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Absolutely. I can see that. I, I'm just thinking of so many people, but I know because you're right. People are, you know, I talk a lot about people are exiting the workforce at such a rate now. And that for yep. me is a real shame um, I, I know I did. So it's a bit like pot calling the kettle black, but actually <laughs> working with organizations and working with those people, it's, it's not about the exit. It's about building that better workplace where people can grow, develop, and actually really love what they do because there comes a point where you go, what else can I do? What yeah. else can I do? Or you see an organization or you go and see your friend down the pub and they're going, you know, I'm getting to work on this project. They go, why can't I do that? How I do I come, come and work yeah. for you, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So it feels like that. This is that community it, yeah. where people can actually do that. Exactly. I think I read a quote the other day. Um, I can't take credit for this, but I just love the way it was worded, <laughs> which is um, employers can't commit to employing you forever, but they can now commit to be making you employable forever. Yeah. And I just loved yeah. that because I think that's per perfectly put. Yeah. Today's climate is not one where you can commit to someone with all honesty that you can give them a role for the next five years. You can't do that anymore. And I think it's, especially with Gen Z, they know that loyalty in many ways is dead in the workplace. And I think any ways that you can offer career development and upskilling that goes beyond the usual, we'll find opportunities in your role or here's some e-learning that's really going to engage people and get them excited about their career prospects. I think it's going to put you a cut above the rest um, in a way that employers would love to compete in that sense now. So um, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're perfect. It's perfectly put. Um, I have so many friends who um, we called it the big quit where about a year ago, they all just went, I don't want to do this anymore. I need to quit my job now because if I don't quit it now and do something else now, I'm never going to have the opportunity to do so. And I just thought that's so sad, isn't it? When you think about it, because there will be so many other stages in your life, but because life gets in the way, you can't necessarily go and do that project in another organization that you're dying to do. Um, so to have that flexibility or that kind of that opportunity for your people at some point throughout their career 
um, I think it's just quite a strong argument for employees wanting to be part of your organisation. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I'm thinking as as your company evolves, <laughs> yeah. that this will be great for people who perhaps are thinking about, because, you know, everyone's talking about portfolio careers and um, yeah. flexible working is still a big topic, but having having that flex where they can go and learn something different or add to their skills portfolio and then yeah. come back a much richer person. You get that retention. I'm just thinking, you know, perhaps somebody wants to work part-time, but their organization can't accommodate it. Yeah. And yet rather than lose them, they could go, well, actually, could we, could we do something? So we might change your contract, but actually we're going to second you out loan you out where you can yeah. develop your skills, do something you love. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it's such a big skills matching opportunity. Yeah. It really is. And I think every organization reaches those quiet periods and or has mm. those periods of disengagement. And I think um, this is a perfect tool for that. But also um, we have a really interesting use case at the moment, which is cropping up more and more, which is kind of fractional secondments at a more leadership mm. position. So for example, a chief marketing officer being given the opportunity to go and do marketing one day a week for a startup that really needs that kind of experience of, say, they're in, I don't know, Series A style um, start startup yep. and they really need some of those measures and processes put in place. Having someone from enterprise coming and helping them with that is perfect. So, um, and, the, you know, back to the employee, the employee then gets that opportunity to go and dip their toe in startups and re engage them and see something completely new and different. And I think. Again, we talk about it so much, but all those hidden benefits of upskilling, but also hidden benefits of keeping and retaining your employee, yeah. college, cross-pollination, you know, network, all those things that that employee brings is far richer than just their role and their delivery in that role. So giving them more opportunities to do those things, it's only going to be more valuable to your organization. So yeah, absolutely. So you and I get that and there'll be other people. That <laughs> we do. That. <laughs> right. But is there an education piece for the organization and the individual? 100%. So I think um, you'll notice that's my favorite saying. I say 100% and bang on a lot. So I apologize if I've said it too <laughs> much. In this podcast. But um, yeah, I think so. I think employees, luckily, there is this huge tailwind of wanting variety in their careers. So the opportunity to go and do things elsewhere, it's just a very easy sell. I think for employers, we are working with lots of quite innovative, forward-thinking HR people, organisations that really want to do something different with their retention, their career development, but also um, understanding that workforce agility piece and the cost savings mm. that that could create. So we jokingly say our perfect sales room is someone who has an innovative CPO in it, but also a CEO or a CFO that really gets the costs. So I think it, absolutely. In short, we, it, it definitely does take a bit of education. I think we've got some brilliant tailwinds behind us. Um, and also the benefit of so many organizations doing anything they can to avoid the redundancies that they've seen in the past and the mass layoffs that have been all over the press. They know the cost of them culturally, from a press perspective, um, internally, yeah. you know, so many yeah. costs to them. They will yeah. do everything they can to avoid it. I literally had a call this morning um, with an organization who just said their biggest pain today is that they cannot pl plan far enough ahead. And I hear that all the time. They don't know what is coming around the corner. COVID taught us that, but also a multitude of other things have taught us that. And I think having a tool in their toolkit that enables them to deploy out some of their employees in a time where that will really help with costs and doesn't have the binary permanent redundancy element. Um, but also, obviously, with redundancies, you can't then rehire very quickly either. That's kind of let limits around hiring. So being able to have that other tool in their back pocket, I think it's definitely helping sell this a lot faster. Um, so, yeah, I think there are a lot of tailwinds that are helping mm. us with that education piece. I'm interested about the comment you said, um, and I'm going to pick up on it, about not being able to know what's coming in five years' time. Is that really true? <laughs> I think... <laughs> Oh, gosh, be careful with my words here. I'm thinking of the clients who might watch it. I think there, I, you know, I do, I'll start with why I feel slightly sorry for organizations. And I think it's because, as I said earlier, with every other asset, there is a third way. There's 
you either keep it and you live in it like a house, you either sell the house or you rent it out. Rent it out is the third way. There is no third way with workforce management. And I think finding and creating a tool that does allow them to have that third way might finally give them another choice that they can deploy that's a bit more proactive, um, whereas we're often seeing reactive choices. Now, I'm not saying that everything is unplannable um, or everything is unforecastable, um, but I do think there there is a limit to how much they can mm. forecast for. And I think having a tool like this might help with that. Yeah. I think this is, for me, that sounds like it's matching the, you know, the ambitious mission that organisations have. Yeah. Okay, you, you don't have a perfect scenario, but you've got a reasonable idea of where you're trying to, the organisation trying to go. And then you know exactly where your employees are, well, not exactly, but you, you've got a good sense of where your team are now. And then you make your best effort to match that. But talking about skills is feels like it's the fundamental bedrock or should be of organizations right now. I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, we just talked about skills-based matching and I think skills-based work is where the future is going. I'm a big fan of everything that UST are doing. Um, I I think John Windsor is a big um, speaker in this space about open talent. And I think Mm. the future is matching what you need in your organization to skills out there that can accommodate it. And I think it will be a very different model. And between then and now, I think the migration and the change that will happen in workforce planning and management and the way that you bring in skill sets is going to drastically change. Um, And I think you can either embrace it and change the ways in which you do things, or you can kind of sit back and just watch it all crumble. That would be my (laughs) that would be my two cents on it. Well, it would Um, make it harder. Harder. We, you know, we've already seen how organizations have struggled and actually struggling right now. Yeah. Um, with hiring good people. And I, to be honest, I get a bit bored of the rhetoric because it's, you know, really real struggle to hire, real struggle yeah. to retain. And actually there are some straightforward levers that people can pull. So having, like you said, this in your back pocket, well, actually we could try this yeah. and, you know, start somewhere yeah. and then you can mature it as time goes on. Oh, and I think um, I was reading earlier, um, Again, a Harvard Business School professor, I think, but he was saying about how there are a lot of organizations right now making penny smart but pound foolish decisions, which are yeah. letting go a lot of, of a lot of people, but actually the cost is not better for you. It's it's actually a lot worse by doing that. And I think it's getting them over that thought process, which unfortunately is just baked into their accounting. They think that their biggest cost is the yeah. employee. They can't be seen as an asset, so you can't invest in them. So it is it is also a CFO accounting problem. But I do mm. think being able to kind of take your brain to what could we do differently that might change this going forward, um, or at least just pilot it and trial it and see what might happen differently. Could this be a better way of bringing in the skill sets we do need and training up the skill sets we do need? And I think, yeah, that that's where mm. it lies. So how would you talk about piloting there? So how would an organization pilot this? Yeah, so it's free to join us. Um, We're a member-based organization. So when you join up, um, join us and our membership, you are signing up to our terms. So that covers everything from IP to non-poaching, all those lovely things that tend to trip up the comments. Um, Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you can either upload a candidate profile or you can upload an opportunity. And when a match is made, we initiate that secondment agreement. So what we say to organisations, especially as we talked about that education piece, just give it a go. It's a secondment which works exactly how secondments work today. We're just connecting you with other organisations you'd otherwise never meet. um, And we just streamline the process. That's kind of how we do it. So we kind of encourage a lot of organisations who are facing that hurdle, especially with their leadership, of selling this to their leadership. Um, we just say, just give it a go, give it a pilot, um, and we can help facilitate that pilot. Take that one individual in your organization that springs to mind when you talk about upskilling and re-engagement and giving them an opportunity and put them on secondment and give them that opportunity of six months to go and contribute to another organization who really need that extra pair of hands and just see what the ROI is, see what the feedback loops are. We're very keen on our data at Ditto, so we'll very much help gather that data for you. Um, and I think that really helps sell it. Mm-hmm. Um, and is there a messaging piece internally? So say if they trial it with 
I'm thinking of the skeptical people that I know. So Charlie yeah. was one person, you know, highly skilled, highly talented. Maybe they're a bit bored, maybe on a yeah. trajectory somewhere. Um, how how do they manage the messaging internally? Because some people will go, well, why did they get to go? And I'm still yeah. sat here. Totally. Um, so we actually, we had that quite early doors where a lot of organisations thought about rolling us out as a per, where we said, well, the only danger in doing that is you're almost democratising secondments, which immediately means that all your workforce could turn around and say, I want to go on secondment right now, which doesn't yeah. really work for you. And it kind of removes that workforce agility tools. So um, we really kind of, we, we really push the narrative of make this available to all, to employees that are potentially on high potential lists as an mm-hmm. option for them to keep them in the organisation, retain them, engage them, excite them but also as maybe a two, three year time um, opportunity for them, where after a year or so in the the organization, you can deploy this as almost a perk then um, for them to sign up and start browsing those opportunities with you and your manager. Um, It then means that organizations kind of have the workforce agility element to that, but also it means that the employee can start taking control, I guess, of their own learning and development, which is quite exciting. Um, And you can time that with things that work in your organization. So if you know in two months time, that person's going to have a much quieter time, maybe time in a comment for around that time and start looking about a month ahead of time. Um, but we're in terms of the just general comms that we kind of try and push for organizations to adopt, um, obviously redundancies has quite a negative um, mm. connotation. And we do have a pushback um, from organizations that say, well, what if they just think this is a redundant and be excited by that. And we immediately flip it and say, no, propose this as you're doing everything you absolutely can to retain, engage, and upskill that person. And that is a is something you can almost put your flag up in the air and say, this is what we do for our employees. Um, we don't let them go. We try everything we can to make sure that they have the skills that they need to succeed. They have the career development that they really want. But importantly as well, when things are quiet, we're not going to let you go. We're going to trial this. And I think that has a really strong messaging to employees. Yeah. Yeah. See it as a benefit rather than yeah. the other way, the negative. Exactly. Um, so what kind of future do you envisage for, I guess, ditto, but actually this secondment marketplace for people? Where, where do you sort of see that long term? Wonderful question. I would say we envisage a future where talent sharing is the norm, where Mm. you are not a permanent employee of any organization. You have a home organization, but you work in multiple. Um, And I think that for us, making external mobility, like how we like to call it anyway, the norm, that's the vision. I think an employee having the ability to have the career that they want and being able to have a say in that. and their development is, is a huge mission of ours. Mm, I love that. Sustainability <laughs> is best with people, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do people find out? Go to your website, get in touch with Absolutely. you. What's the best um, way? Completely welcome to get in touch with me directly on LinkedIn. I love a LinkedIn message, so please do go ahead. But also we do have our um, website, which is dittotalent.com. Um, so please just go ahead and um, have a look there and get in contact with us there too. So two very easy routes. Mm. So before you disappear, Susie, yeah. can you give us give people who are intrigued but maybe not quite committed yet to this, can you give them a couple of tips on what to think about and how to get started? Oh, on startups or on secondments? <laughs> on secondments. I would say if you're at all apprehensive, um, as an employee, I'll speak to the employee first. If you're at all apprehensive, um, think about the benefits that will bring you from skill sets, but also your exposure to a whole other industry. So if you're currently in government, you could go to charity sector for six months. Or if you're in finance, you could go to, I don't know, a media conglomerate for six months. The the opportunity to have some experience that will go on your CV that's completely different to your norm couldn't be more beneficial for your career development. Um, And I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't push it more. From an employer's perspective, um, I would just ask you to think slightly differently about your workforce management 
and think about that third way. Think of it like a car. Um, instead of selling it or keeping it, you could loan it out. It's exactly the same concept. And when you're loaning out your people, you're having that gross salary reimbursed. It's an l and opportunity that does not cost you anything. And then an alternative is you're borrowing in skill sets from other organizations at a much more affordable price. We are overall reducing the cost of managing your workforce. And I think if you can engage with that, you can engage with what we're trying to do. I love that. Very succinct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie. It was brilliant. Um, so we'll make sure we put all the links um on the recording at the bottom and yeah I, I mean it sounds amazing i'm looking forward to watching where you go next thank you so much julia it's honestly wonderful chatting to you on a very like mind which is always a pleasure so thank you so much for having me